All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. HKS and Arup welcome you to the Pandemic Resilient Hospital, How Design Can Help Facilities Stay Operational and Safe. I'm pleased to introduce you to your moderator for today's session, Erin Peavy. Erin is the Vice President at HKS and an experienced researcher, planner, and facilitator serving clients across the globe. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's really been such a pleasure um, working with everyone on this call in preparation for this webinar. And um, really, you know, we've seen what a toll this pandemic has put on our healthcare systems and our healthcare providers. And I uh, feel really privileged to be able to explore this issue with our colleagues um, and to be able to listen to Althea and Liz um, share their stories from the front lines and from what this is looking like um, in practice. And what we really hope that you get out of today is, is both an idea of some of the core issues that are ahead of us, but also what are some of the concrete strategies for addressing these and how are they working throughout the nation? Um, so I wanted to jump into our panel. Let me try and do that. Here we go. All right. So first we have Althea Mills. Althea is CN CNO and VP of Patient Care Services at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. Althea started her nursing career in a tiny West Indian island in Tobago nearly 30 years ago and has taken on many different roles from bedside nurse to faculty and now chief nursing officer. Althea, we're really excited to have you here. Thank you so much. We also have Liz Youngblood. Liz is president of Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center and senior vice president and chief operating officer at Texas Division of St. Luke's Health. Liz is a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives and has an impressive track record of elevating operations, financial excellence, care quality with 20 years range of different healthcare systems, winning numerous awards for her work. Liz, thank you so much for being here. We're really happy to have you. Next, we have Bill Scranton. Bill is a principal at Arab's Los Angeles office and the national healthcare leader. He is a nationally recognized expert in planning and design of sustainable healthcare environments, helping clients throughout the globe. And it's really been a pleasure working with Bill, Min, and the entire Arab team on this important topic over the past few months. So thank you so much for being here, Bill. Um, last but not least is HKS's global health leader, Jason Schroer. Um, Jason is an experienced architect, planner, and leads HKS's health practice, helps clients across the globe navigate the pandemic and plan for the future. His insights into this project have been invaluable. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Jason and Bill to really give us a broad overview of the recently completed Pandemic Resilient Hospital Design Report, providing a background and a foundation that we'll sort of build off of as we jump into the panelists. Discussion. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Really appreciate it. Um, I don't know who's got control of the deck, but we may want to try to get there. We go. Thank you. Uh, yeah. The you know the challenge is obvious. It, it's um, most of us are probably on the call have some experience uh, around what's been going on over about the last year. But you know, with with the onset of COVID, um, you know, our, our health facilities. Um, have been on the front lines and you know the challenge has been is what can we do together um, so that our health clients can uh, maintain operations uh, and so we can create uh, safe places for people to continue to get care uh, so you know in, in the spirit of trying to think about design ideas on how design can actually support operations um, in facilities around the ability for them to flex and be versatile um, to, you know, take on the impact of surge to also maintain operations mm -hmm. for all those other things that still need to happen um, is, is really important. And I think that's the spirit of the conversation today. Uh, and, and we were, we were grateful that Arup joined us in kind of a think tank study. We published a little bit of a paper around some design ideas on how facilities uh, can maintain operations, you know, during uh, 
these episodes that we're experiencing right now uh, with the pandemic. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the approach, but first off, you know, it's been a, a, a great pleasure to, you know, to collaborate with HKS. This is certainly not uh, the first time we've collaborated with HKS because we actually have a, uh, a global story together and we bring those uh, stories uh, to this particular uh, document. But the approach uh, that we took for this document was really uh, heavily influenced by what we heard from hospital owners. Um, you know, all of them certainly seemed interested in gaining access to some kind of a consolidated guidance document uh, to help them with their current challenges. And they all seemed to also agree with us that, uh, you know, COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic that uh, unfortunately we see in our lifetimes. Uh, but additionally, many expressed concerns um, about overspending on things that may rarely be used. If you know, if you think about it, 99% of the time we're going to be in normal operations. Of course, we have to get past this pandemic first. Um, but we don't want you know building systems that consume too much energy all the time or require added maintenance, and we don't want spaces that feel super institutional in lieu of being focused on patient experience because eventually we've got to get back to some of the important things that we were dealing with before. So. Um, you know, it's really what we found is a, it's really important to to balance, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, and, and frame the discussion uh, around that balance in our approach. Yeah. Some of the ideas uh, that we, you know, kind of gathered and, and categorized uh, in the work that we did together, um, are, you see on the screen right here, these, these principles of versatility, surge ready, uh, supporting well-being, uh, excited to kind of hear some experiences from Liz and Althea on that. Uh, clean air and surfaces, uh, isolate, contain, separate uh, the idea of flow, physical flow of people and things, and the digital physical. I mean, I think we've all now seen that, you know, there are some benefits to telehealth and, you know, figuring out where those might fit in uh, in the future as we move forward. But I, I I just wanted to kind of talk about versatility a little bit in particular as it comes to design and you'll see in the report that uh, we try to take this approach around kind of this normal mode and then pandemic mode um, you know essentially meta and metaphorically can you switch a button or a push a button or flip a switch to where you can convert into a pandemic mode operations and what that might look like um, you know we've always designed facilities for flexibility and that was flexibility over time. I think what the pandemic has taught us is that we need to now design facilities that are flexible and can quickly convert. Uh, and that's, you know, a lot of the uh, design thinking that's gone into this. Absolutely. You know, the, you know, as you look at, you know, the seven principles there, it's pretty obvious that really none of them can be considered in isolation of the others. Uh, we, we obviously delve into each of them, but they all kind of collectively informed what we were up to. And the goal, again, was to create a balance with uh, with them and not focus on one at the expense of another. So uh, when you look at our guidance document, you'll see that, you know, we put forth uh, um ideas, but they're not prescriptive solutions. Again, they're balanced against these, these uh, seven principles. And um, we uh, weighed them not only uh, against, you know, uh, this the strategy in itself, but also against that the, the point was to put them out there because every site's going to be a little bit different and every specific operational model is going to be different for our clients. And so it's not prescriptive. Um, but we uh, did try to provide a, a level of insight on relative efficacy of the different strategies uh, and their relative operational impact of application. Uh, and of course, again, it's, you know, is, are we talking about a new building? Are we talking about an existing building? Are we talking about a building level strategy or room level strategy, et cetera? But to me, you know, the seven principles really helped us balance the guidance between clinical operations and building operations. I think that's a great way to say it, Bill. And, you know, then we began to look at, you take those seven principles and how do they impact campus design down to building design, down to unit design and down to room design. And so we began to really investigate in a little bit more deeply into how each of those categories perhaps could be 
uh, approached uh, when it comes to that normal mode versus pandemic mode and some ideas there. And so we won't get into a lot of details there, but that gives you a good outline of some of the thinking that we put into this. Uh, the document uh, is available um, uh, to, that you can take a look at it through uh, a web website. Yeah, you know, in, in terms of key takeaways for the document specifically, um, you know, you know, we if you if you think back about it and you look at it today, it's obvious we weren't prepared for COVID nineteen, and it's vital that we not just take the lessons learned from COVID nineteen, but consider that uh, the next pandemic uh, might be a little bit different and it might be a little tougher, frankly, than than this particular one. And so that was, uh, you know, a key takeaway. Um, also, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, incorporating both inherent as well as provisional flexibility uh, as an affordable way to prepare for uh, the next issue. Um, and then, you know, flexibility considerations uh, that both consider, you know, what does this mean for the patient and, and, and the systems, but also what does it mean to the caregivers? We really learned a lot about, you know, our typical focus on what does it mean to the patient. Uh, and then there's a lot of preparatory requirements, uh, donning, doffing spaces, et cetera, that need to be considered uh, as part of the overall planning. So thank you so much. Um, and this is the slide that has all the panelists. Sorry for the technical difficulty earlier, um, but without further ado, let's jump on in. All right. So I think Bill just gave a wonderful segue to specifically designing for flexibility. And we've seen that across the globe that this pandemic has required a really swift and strong response from our hospitals. And both Liz and Althea, I would love to have you guys start by telling us both how your hospital responded and in that process, what did you learn that has changed the way that you think of design for the future? Althea, would you mind starting us off? Well, sure. Well, first of all, thank you to everyone for having me on. Um, this is exciting to talk about. It's, it is also a little emotional for me when I take myself back in that, on that dreadful day in March, when we as a team realized that indeed it is happening. You know, we heard back in January, uh, my infectious prevention nurse said to me, did you hear what's happening in China? And I said, no, what's happening? Her office is just one door from me. And she began to talk about it. And I was leaving to go away on vacation. And I said, well, let me pack up. So I packed up and I was the only person on that aircraft that day. I still have a picture I posted on Facebook saying, I am dressing up. I put on mask and I had gloves and I pretended that I was so sick because I, I knew people were looking at me. I said, okay, so let me pretend that I'm the one coughing. <laughs> Because I didn't want to look like if I was, you know, so paranoid. So I turned myself and I was like, oh, oh, oh. Anyway, when I came back, I came back on the, I guess, February 1, uh, March 1. And then this thing started hitting us. March 11th, we had our first patient, and it was the first in Suffolk County. And we all convened a team right away. We came from home on a Saturday and we came from home to give some support to our nurses. And on that Monday, when the governor said, we have to be prepared to uh, increase our capacity to 50% more. And then in two weeks, 100% more, you could hear a pin drop because we were like, okay, like, what are you really telling us? Nobody, everybody just stared at each other. I'm like, okay, what are we going to do? About an hour later, my boss called us in. He said, listen, they're serious and they're threatening to take away our licenses if we don't or, you know, our operating permit. So, well, I guess we just have to start working. The first thing, because we're a very small hospital, we're a 98 bed hospital. On one of the floors, it is one of the, the older floors. We have two buildings connected. The idea came at the same time and I said, well, 
anybody who has a bathroom, you gotta get out. So that was the first thing. And we started knocking on doors. Do you have a bathroom? Okay, start packing. You have a bathroom, start packing. And so we reclaimed all the offices that were around just mm -hmm. so that we could start working on something. Yeah. Okay. So reclaiming those offices was one of our saving graces. And mm -hmm. then we have a strong um, well-being, like a wellness area that housed a gym and uh, some, I guess there was a couple of bathrooms there. And we said, okay, the gym equipment has to go. We have to make this like an open ward. Where I came from, I was used to the open ward system. Mm -hmm. So right away, we started designing this new hospital ward. Mm -hmm. So space was one of our, our, our issues. We had to create space that was never before used for patient care. Yeah. And then the other thing, and I don't want to take up all, you know, I know Liz wants to talk as well, is the negative pressure. So yeah. in the first instant, we weren't quite sure what the disease, the, the management of the disease entailed because nobody really knew. So one day it was droplet and the next day it was airborne. And then the following day it was like a mixture between and we were doing the dance. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, okay, then we need negative pressure. In our nice, tiny little hospital, maybe once in a while, we're gonna see a TB patient come across. And that's when we utilize the negative pressure room for yeah. the purpose that it was designed for. But now, if we're gonna have a room full of people that was predicted, then we have to have all negative pressure rooms. Mm -hmm. And so my design for the future, the first thing that I would like to see is the ability to flex from a regular room to a negative pressure room. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, all the rooms should have a bathroom. All the rooms would like to be transformed into a negative pressure room. And then last but not least is I would like to see glass doors or windows in every room because we, the challenge existed where we put patients behind those doors that needed to be monitored. Mm -hmm. We had to come up with makeshift monitors because the, the hospital wasn't designed for monitor, for, tele, for telemetry everywhere. So we quickly bought um, transport monitors to fill the need. Mm -hmm. But now putting the patient behind there and a transport monitor, we can't see neither the patient nor the monitor. Yeah. So yeah. that was quite a challenge for us. So I gave you three big areas that were our first three biggest challenges, you know, yeah. adapt, you know, flexible wise. Yeah. And no, that's wonderful. And I feel like, you know, if you're, if you're comfortable sharing a little bit, I know that you're you're designed a new facility and I feel like, you know, you're helping to implement some of those things, right? Definitely. Perfect. We were, and, and in a way, you know, they always say a curse or a blessing, it depends on how you look at it. Yeah. So because we had gone through the experience of that first surge yeah. and felt shortened by um, those challenges, we were all eager to ask for all these or to suggest these things in our new developing, developing our new uh, uh, hospital. You know, sometimes we felt like we were dreaming, you know, like <laughs> enough already. We felt like, okay, okay, calm down. Those things come with the money attached to it. But I think it's really very necessary because if we don't learn from our past experiences, then we condemn to repeat it. So, before I close my eyes, I would like to see those, at least those three things. So there was one thing, you know, in the, in the emergency room where we were going about developing an, an area, like uh, they call it the clinical decision area. So we were going back and forth, you know, we're gonna be a 10 bed area, just call it a figure, and two bathrooms. Oh, I flew off my chair like, what? No! We need a bathroom in each room because we really don't know what we, what's going to happen. At least this time it is airborne and droplet. The next one might be abdominal issues. So what are we going to do then? Yeah. No, thank you. That's so wonderful. Um, 
So Liz, I was wondering if you could also sort of speak to what your experience has been, um, what maybe came up when Althea was talking and what was your unique experience? And also someone had asked on the, on the panel, um, Althea is from New York um, and based in Suffolk County. Yes. Sorry. Well, I would just start by saying that I agree with a lot of what Althea had just shared. I mean, just the simple concept of having a window in a door to be able to see a patient on the other side is something that we really didn't think about until the time came and we couldn't see our patients. Um, so I would just say at the very beginning of the pandemic, we really didn't know what to expect. And to Althea's point earlier, it was it was droplet, it was airborne, it was droplet, it was airborne, it was both. It was, you know, and, and so we really had to be very flexible and we weren't exactly sure how to go about making sure that we, number one, could take care of our patients well, but that we could keep our, our, our staff safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. So really for us, it was about just preparing for anything. So we just decided to do a complete inventory of our rooms, figure out what we had from an ICU capability, look at our med surge units and figure out how many ventilators we could get on there based upon the power that we had available on that unit. Um, we looked at uh, all of our equipment, uh, what could we convert? You know, what how many anesthesia machines could I convert to a ventilator if I needed that? Mm -hmm. um, the, our ECMO machines, what, what, would, what would we be able to do with all that equipment and how could we use that on some very, very sick patients? And the other thing we did is that we recognized immediately that we didn't have enough negative pressure rooms. And that's on my wish list, Athea, is that every single room can convert yeah. to a negative pressure. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so if I built something from the ground up, I would have that flexibility immediately so that you don't have to worry about moving your patients around. But because we didn't get to do that, we did have to figure out how we were going to create some negative pressure and what we were going to do for those areas that we couldn't create negative pressure. And so we actually um, had some air scrubbers and some HEPA filters, but we didn't have enough. And so we were in the middle of a, a couple of construction projects and we actually reached out to one of our builders and said, hey, we're out of resources for getting some air scrubbers. Do you have any? And sure enough, they did. And so we ended up with some really unique partnerships too, just trying to, to from, deliver healthcare to our patients. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we did is we looked at the physical plant and the layout. So one of the first places we went to our, is to our emergency departments. And we realized that at our registration desks and our security desks, we didn't have any kind of barrier between the people who were sitting behind the desk and the people who were walking up to it. And so we immediately put up some plexiglass in all of our uh, admitting areas and created um, some, some, some barriers between um, those who were arriving and, and our staff, again, just to make sure that everyone stayed safe because you were trying to protect your staff, but you were also trying to protect the people who were coming into your hospital. And the last thing I would say that, that was really important to us is we really looked at our layout. When you think about how hospitals are set up right now, we actually encourage togetherness. So think about our waiting rooms, right? So we've got families that we want to create little clumps and clusters with our furniture so that they can be together and, and provide support to each other. And so here we are in a pandemic, we're trying to get everybody as far apart as possible. And I've got pieces of furniture that don't come apart, you know? And so, um, and so really looking at um, having that flexibility to redesign your rooms very quickly um, to Althea's point earlier, I think is hugely important. Um, and, and just understanding what capabilities you have in some of the other areas of your hospital, for example, um, repurposing our PACUs and some of our other patient care spaces. Again, just understanding what flexibility we had built into our facility. Correct. Oh, that's wonderful. I love yeah. that. Um, so Jason, in your work with healthcare systems, have you seen particular facilities that you feel really embody flexibility and how have they fared throughout this pandemic? Do you have any lessons learned? Well, I mean, I think we've seen, you know, some uh, be fortunate enough to kind of have some things in place that um, they were able to, you know, flex quickly. We all saw the images of beds and lobbies, right? And beds and parks under tents and, you know, also conversions of you know, uh, big conference centers, right? Convention centers to for, for overload. And so, um, you know, I think the honest answer is, you know, we struggled with a lot of our clients because it wasn't as though that we didn't have flexibility in mind, but as Liz just mentioned, and Althea pointed out, we weren't able to flex quick enough. And so, um, 
in some cases, we had some implemented some design measures that worked really well. We had a client in Orlando in their emergency department, and uh, this was pre-pandemic. We had designed a cluster of rooms that could be isolated if they ever needed to be, uh, you know, for whatever might come. And um, here comes the pandemic. Here goes the test. They, they push the button, the doors close, the air changes a little bit, and they're able to then isolate, you know, a small group of patients and right. uh, it worked really well. The, the challenge was, is it, you know, wasn't big enough and they, you know, they needed five or six of them as opposed yeah. to just one. But those ideas are things that, you know, are, are, are that got tested, right. And we, we've learned from, and now we can take some of those lessons learned and some of those outcomes and begin to think, how would we do that more strategically and more flexibly with new facilities moving forward? Awesome. Thank you. Um, Bill, in your work with various healthcare systems, how are you seeing design for flexible HVAC solutions take place? And is this different based on the type of facility? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I kind of referenced something earlier uh, that the concept of inherent flexibility and provisional flexibility and, you know, um, a lot of amazing uh, stories between uh, Althea and, and Liz uh, that are worth kind of touching on. But, you know, the, the basic concept that I'm describing uh, with inherent and provisional is inherent is basically designing systems so that they can play two roles, right? They can play normal operational role and then kind of to the point that uh, Jason had, you, you know, you, you can push a button and they can, then they can move into another role. Uh, the, the, you, they don't have to, I mean, the pandemic, uh, it doesn't just show up in a moment, you know, you have a little bit of heads up. So it, it doesn't have to be push a button, but it has to be relatively easy to uh, to um, turn it into that other mode. Um, an example, you know, uh, might be that uh, we, and the trick about inherent is that you have to design the systems for both, strat, both scenarios. Mm -hmm. So that means you're gonna oversize the systems, right? You might not be using them, that way, but they're but they're set to do that, right? And and so an example might be if you know if we take a fan and uh, the distribution system, uh, uh, set it up so that it's designed to efficiently operate in the normal condition, but it's oversized to increase the airflow during an event, right? So that's you know one strategy. The other strategy uh, is a provisional flexibility strategy, and that means that you've cr created space and you've created maybe connections. Uh, so that you can add whatever it is when you need it, but it's not there in place full time. Uh, so uh, maybe a non-HVAC example might be in a patient room, uh, you've got inbound toilets and you've got, you know, the hand washing foyer. If it's prepped with a little space and wall clips to accommodate uh, an acceptance of an ICRA boundary, an ICRA barrier to form a pop-up ante room, that is, again, that's provisional. You, you've planned for it, but you don't have it in all of the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that those two items are really key. And then, you know, again, as we started out talking about, where you provide flexibility is also key and, and it's not one or the other, right? It really, uh, what we found in our, in our, what we found with our clients, what we found in putting together the document is really an important uh, uh, focus on looking at say campus level, building level, unit level, room level, all of those. And that, that um, we really needed to understand how all of those were impacted. But, um, and it's interesting, I saw somebody's name pop up on the screen from the, from the UK. And I was going to mention that the other issue, interestingly enough, is supply chain. So, you know, it's beyond the, the say the, the campus borders and, and flexibility as it relates to that. And my, uh, the example that I always think about is uh, oxygen. So when we uh, started to see issues with oxygen with our UK hospital clients last summer, you know, it started out with, well, you know, the rooms don't have enough uh, outlets. There's not enough medical gas outlets to, you know, to place patients just anywhere. And kind of to uh, Althea's point about, you know, not enough toilets, uh, but so not enough med gas outlets. But the next thing you knew that when you, when you were able to gain access to enough ventilators, when they put all of the, the ventilators on there at the same time, it taxed the system. Right. So so now the distribution and even the source couldn't keep up. But then finally, even if you solved all those problems, they found out that community wide, they started to run out of oxygen or at least an ability to deliver it. So they started 
crazy enough to go to scuba shops and get them to give them their tanks so that they can fill them with oxygen and use them at hospitals. Yeah. So it all sounded super crazy until frankly, just a couple of weeks ago, we started to hear about that same issue, you know, here in the, in the U S. And so the, I guess the big lesson there is that you have to think about all these different levels to create a sustainable solution to these challenges. That's true. And just to add Bill, our community here in Southampton, we were lucky that there are a lot of business entrepreneurs that live in our community. Mm -hmm. And they were able to source inventory for us. This, they were connected in some way, shape or form to supply chains. And so this, this is the network that we lived in and they really saved us with everything from ventilators to you just name it. They were just bringing it in, calling us. And sometimes we were scared because we were wondering, is this for real? What do they want from us? You know, we don't want somebody to show up and say, you know, I gave it to you, treat me first, that kind of way. Yeah, right. But they were very helpful in providing all the supplies that we needed, all the extra supplies. That's wonderful. Yes. So, um, before we move on to the next topic, I just want to kind of recall some of the major themes that we heard. For me, it was it was really number one talking about how do we surge, how do we surge into existing spaces, whether it's PACU or or offices or whatever spaces that we can to figure this out, and how do we plan for that? The you know idea between inherent and provisional flexibility. I think that building both of those in and figuring out, you know, that that balance between them. Also clearly around, you know, both pressurization and cleanliness of the air is a major issue. Um, and even, you know, the small ways that you guys talked about visibility, I think, you know, that's part of it seems like determines what allows us to surge and stay safe. Um, which is probably a good transition to our next topic, which is really this focus around um, design for safety. And I think we all understand that keeping facilities safe and communicating to the public that they are safe um, is critical to stay operational during this pandemic. And I was hoping that you guys could share with us some of your biggest hurdles to addressing safety and how building design can help foster that. Liz, would you mind starting us off? Sure, well, I, I did mention the waiting rooms and the fact that we are set up to sort of group people together. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing in our cafeterias and just about all of our public spaces. They're built for groups of people um, and not a lot of flexibility to sort of get people spread out when you've got to do that. Um, I would say the other thing uh, that we had and we talked about this is just, um, you know, not having enough flexibility in our rooms. I actually saw a question in the Q&A or a comment about being able to flip from positive to negative pressure. And uh, this was a hot topic in Texas a few years ago. Um, and uh, what we found is that if you can do a terminal clean between the, the switches that generally speaking, you could do it, but uh, that, that was a few years ago. So, um, but I, I would say the other thing that we found um, is that when we started having to screen people and screen visitors, same issue, physical distance, right? And we slowed down coming into our hospital and we would end up with long lines of staff who were trying to get into our facility. And then when you think about it, they're, they're going outdoors. And if you didn't, some of our hospitals didn't have good coverage outdoors. And so in bad weather, you know, we had to set up tents to cover our staff in some of our hospitals so that we could screen them coming in. You know, there's obviously a lot of screening um, systems that are out there now that screen your staff very quickly. Um, but again, the, the physical distance when you have large volumes of people coming in are important. I liked the example, Jason, that you shared with a hospital who could sort of push a button, sort of shut things down. At our main hospital on the Texas Medical Center campus, we actually are connected to other hospitals. So we didn't just have to shut down doors. And by the way, hospitals have a ton of doors. So I never knew how many doors we had. But we had to figure out all the connectivity that we had in all the, in the basement on different floors with all the hospitals around us and figure out how do we, you know, maintain the safety 
of the people within each of the organizations and yet prevent the movement of people in and out. Uh, and, we, and quite frankly, the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of concern about security of gloves and masks. And a lot of people were having seen, you know, some of those things disappearing. And so again, having the ability to control the access in your facility is really important. So I'd say those were some of the biggest hurdles that we found in addition to just the equipment and the, the pressure and those sort of things that we talked about earlier. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Althea, what about you? How's your experience been? So very much like what Liz explained. So access was one of the big things for us as well. What we did in the emergency room that Liz didn't mention is that we created a forward triage system. So we and pretty much took a tent put it like, like an awning in front of our triage emergency room and extend it out as far as possible to keep people at bay. So no cars could come in. Uh, we had security out front. We, you know, all, all the staff that were working out front, we pretty much had nurses, nurses aides to pre-screen these patients so that they won't just walk or run into the emergency room, okay? Signage was another important thing for us. And signage in different language so that people would wear their mask or say if they had a fever, if they have any respiratory illness. So we had to do a lot of signage to explain before we could contact. One of the other things, and I like when Liz mentioned about connectivity. Yes, I did not realize that hospitals were so interconnected. We had to build temporary walls, even on, on one unit. So in the beginning, when we started off using one part of the unit, we had to put up temporary plastic walls or double plastic to, and signage again to prevent staff that is not in that area from going through. We have to think about dietary, housekeeping, um, you know, the radiology staff. They had to clearly, we had to clearly indicate what was happening beyond those walls. Of course, without trying to, you know, HIPAA and all that. So we, we came up with some creative signage and um, some little magnets that we would identify which rooms were positive COVID, which rooms were PUI and the areas, you know. Another thing that we had to do for safety was when well, we already talked about the, the doors not having um, windows. So we instituted cameras, we got baby monitors in there because one of the, the, the side effects that we noticed that was coming along with the disease was the confusion with the patients. Uh, you know, it was explained out that there's blood clotting, you know, in different vessels. We don't we as yet know how it affected the brain, but patients were falling and they were becoming really confused. And as nurses and healthcare workers, we were not, although we were concerned, we were terribly concerned with contracting the diseases. We were still very concerned about our patients and we didn't want them to fall or to feel isolated behind there. So, you know, we, we, we did have that, you know, building up a wall first, I think in your head, and then recognizing that the barriers are there to protect us. And the donning and the doffing and everything, you know, we had to create the hot zones, the cold zones. But most of all, putting that barrier up as a, a second level of reminding us that we need to take care of ourselves as well by putting on our PPEs before venturing further into uh, the patient's I'll, rooms. Althea, I would just say that you just made a really good point, and that is that we have our green zones, our yellow zones, and our red zones, right? And right. so uh, having the capability to segment your space that way, your patient care space is really important. And initially, when we had our COVID closed units, we couldn't really segment our yellow and red. And so we ended up with green, which is really probably yellow okay. and red. And um, eventually we're able to move up to spaces where we could get those three segments. But that's a really 
important point that you just made. Yes, it, it was essential. And of mm -hmm. course, the hand washing, you know, hand washing sometimes you know, we think that it is it is the least, but it actually is is the is the best form of our protection against diseases, mm -hmm. and it is safety for all of us. So, putting sinks in our future hospitals in creative spaces. I don't know if this is going to be provisional or inherent. Bill, but we realized that we did nearly have as many sinks and faucets that we really need to. So I don't know how we're going to do that because from your um, architectural and the coding system, you know, you have to have a certain space and things can't be jutting out, but we really do need a lot, of, lot more sinks and the ability to create a faucet running water. Yeah. Bill, do you want to take that and sort of address overall uh, there's designing? Of, yeah. of I know there's so, there's so yeah, much there. Of, one of the that. first questions I just have real quick for Althea is um, in terms of, uh, of sinks and, you know, provisional versus uh, uh, inherent, um, to, to what extent uh, do you to uh, you as well, Liz, feel that um, that uh, uh, that the alcohol gel is an adequate uh, replacement for sinks? I wasn't too comfortable with that. We learned many years ago when we first started out with the alcohol gel that after two uses of that gel, we need to then wash our hands because the efficacy of it is, has been diminished. Mm. I still believe that. I still feel as if when I use the alcohol gel that I, I'm like, I, I need to get somewhere to wash my hands. Interesting. Interesting. You know, so we have been re encouraged that it is, you yeah. know, the efficacy is there mm -hmm. even after many uses. I don't know if that is. Yeah, no, I think that's a super interesting point. I mean, maybe the combination too, you know, maybe, you know, uh, you, you uh, address the, you know, alcohol in and out of the, of the room and then you, you make uh, available a sink, you know, yeah. to, to take that second step. So I think yeah. that's super interesting. You know, I was, you know, when we think about uh, design for safety um, from an engineering perspective, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're pretty focused in on infection control. And uh, our philosophy is really to kind of look at the strategy, the issue from the inside and work our way out. So before we were talking about, you know, looking at the campus, to the building, to the unit, to the room, for infection control, it's exactly the opposite way. We've got to start at the source, right? And so, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, caregiver safety, um, what we found is that, um, you know, the building systems and the systems, the systems in the room, HVAC systems in the room, they're, they're inadequate uh, to provide the level of protection to caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, now, we, we frankly first really saw this uh, acutely when we were doing some work for the NHS in the UK. And it was specifically related to a, a, a little bit different uh, issue, but uh, AGP shields. And so, um, hopefully everyone knows that, you know, what one of the big challenges for caregivers during COVID-19 was intubation uh, because uh, an AGP stands for aerosol generating procedure. Yeah. And so the concept is to put what amounts to collect like a clear glove box, if you will, over the top of the, of the patient yeah. so that you can get in there and do the work and get, you know, do the intubation without, um, you know, really inhaling what's, what's coming the other way. Uh, the, the trick though was that uh, the AGP shield works great until you take it off. And yeah. when you take it off, you contaminated the whole room. And so we worked with them to um, uh, take advantage of a, uh, and we proved out through computational fluid dynamics, it's mathematical modeling, that um, a, a strategy to put medical vacuum inside the AGP shield so it's evacuating the air all the time and creates like a negative pressure zone around right. the patient's head, that that works really, really well. And so again, the, the, the issue was, 
uh, treat the problem at the source, right? The room is not going to protect you. You got to you got to handle it at the source. So that began to also for us at least we extrapolated that to the concept of the ventilated headboard. And I really like the concept of the ventilated headboard because again, um, you know, it can be provisional. You don't have to have it in there all of the time. But if you need it, you can set it up so that it's ready to hook up pretty fast. And uh, you know, you you might have to work with your construction partners like Liz was talking about so that you can have the HEPA filter uh, that you want to have, uh, you know, the scrubber, as she described it. Um, but th that concept is drawing air across the source and it's evacuating it before it gets into the room, yeah. protecting the patient so or the caregiver so that the caregivers can get close to the patient, the infectious patient that they're dealing with without having that, you know, coming back at them. So it reduces the risk pretty significantly. So really like that strategy in terms of uh, increasing safety in the room itself and and frankly what it also is doing which is beneficial is it's increasing the airflow in the room uh, and so and then you know that's where you want to handle it now the other thing i wanted there's a couple other things i wanted to touch on and and one was this whole issue that you guys had to deal with as it relates to the, the kind of confusing messages you know whether it be from the community you know the industry the cdc the who is is COVID 19 is it airborne or is it not right <laughs> and so after all kinds of back and forth and debate and and uh, and whatnot and, and certainly confusion uh it's been determined that it's a short range aerosol. And so that basically what that means is that uh, trans, this transmission route, uh, you're at risk if you're in a, in a um, poorly ventilated space or if you're in a crowded space, but you're probably not actually at risk uh, of a scenario where your central building HVAC system induces it and moves it to another room. Probably not an issue there. But again, that's COVID-19, right? And so when we started to look at our analysis and as we're talking to our clients today, we're really talking about, well, what's next? You know, there's a really good, strong possibility, but not good, but strong possibility uh, that the future is gonna bring with a long range aerosol infectious uh, a disease. And so how do we plan for that? So I still think that the concept of the ventilated headboard is the strategy for inside the room. Wow. But now you're starting to talk about what you guys were getting into, and that's a concern about room to room transmission or even room to the next unit transmission mm -hmm. or maybe in through the HVAC system. And so as it relates to that now, absolutely, you need negative pressure, right? Mm -hmm. Negative pressure so that it, you know, air doesn't move from one room to the next room. Now, what we also know, though, frankly, and maybe it's not known to everyone, but negative pressure rooms uh, don't work when you open the door. As soon as you open the door, you created a contamination event with the adjacent space. Mm. So that's why anti rooms are so important. And so a, the pop up provision is really a pretty slick strategy to provide that level of protection that you're needing when you're in that kind of a high risk scenario. And then again, there's different strategies at the HVAC level, you know, from um, different filtration technologies. And uh, frankly, a lot of uh, HVAC systems in the states have what's called air side economizer. And it means that when the weather's nice outside, it can switch to 100% outside air, but you can also use that to switch to 100% outside air if you have this scenario too. So, Thanks. but you know, in, in any case, I believe that the key today is to plan now for the future and that the future is likely to mean more dangerous pandemics. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Bill. Um, any other kind of comments around that um, feedback? I, I really, you know, I picked up on a few themes. I'd love to hear what you guys thoughts are. But number one around sort of access, both understanding, you know, all the connectivity of our buildings and thinking about access and how, how do we control access? A lot of times we're thinking about fostering access, but this is really more about control. I think that is also closely tied to this idea of zoning. You know, how do we segment different care spaces? Um, and, you know, maybe combining both both zoning and, and thinking about source control is really this idea, everything from anti rooms to, you know, how do we can control the source of, of the problem or, you know, of the contaminant um, and also, you know, a major theme around communication and communicating like expected behaviors or behavioral cues, like 
you know, people are having to change their day-to-day behavior so much. How do we help to encourage that um, given, you know, massive amounts of fatigue? So I, I like that point about communication because mm-hmm. when Bill said something, it you know, I, I remember in now in a hospital and our hospital, no doubt, has many different kind of workers and people, a lot of people, they can't make it in one job. Yeah. So they work maybe two or three different hospitals. Mm-hmm. So just imagine people are going out to different hospitals, hearing and seeing and given directions of how to do things over there and coming back, it was a source of confusion. So we're listening to the DOH, the CMS, the governor, and now we have to listen to uh, uh, an employee that is working just up the road that they're doing something different. The ante room was a source of, oh my gosh, that ante room conversation almost drew us crazy. And I think it finally, we quelled it because we just couldn't create it. But you're right when you say that we do need an ante room for effective um, negative pressure airflow. But that communication issue, Erin, it was, it was crazy. I can tell you how we manage it if you want to hear. I would love to, but I think that we're a little tight on time. Yes. Liz, were you going to add something? I, you know, I was actually just going to add that, uh, just to layer on top of Althea, the other thing that we had is the directions that we were getting from the CDC was changing daily as well. And so having the ability to communicate, feeling like you finally got everyone trained and then having to turn around and change that again, um, you know, so anything that we could do from a physical environment standpoint that could create the protections that we needed mm-hmm. um, to help support. Sometimes people just didn't get the, the information to change quick enough. And so we really tried to use our physical environment to help in that space as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, Aaron, can I just add one last point real quick? And that is that's that very you know, a number. Yes, I will. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> And you both mentioned the, the concept of, of, of negative pressure and somebody added to the chat about, you know, the codes. That, so the issue is, in fact, that, yeah, right now, because of COVID-19, you know, there are no rules, right? You, you can get a lot of things uh, approved because of the circumstance. But mm-hmm. normally, um, frankly, every code in the states, the bulk of the United States uses what's called ASHRAE 170, which is part of the FGI guidelines, uh, that says can't do a, a room that switches pressures. No can do. The, uh, the, the code in Texas says the same thing. The code in the state of California says the same thing. So we really have to work. And I think that there's obviously going to be an appetite to talk about having a modification of those codes, but, uh, but we are going to have to address it at the code level as well. Sorry, Erin. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, no, that's great. Um, so one of the things I'd originally hoped that we would be able to get into, but I, I, there's probably not time right now, is just designed for well-being. So we'll we'll plan our next um, <laughs> around that because I, you know, I think that there's no doubt that you know the caregivers that you guys are talking about are essential, and you know their well-being is essential. Um, so I just want to kind of give a nod to that, even though we're not going to have time to necessarily open that up. Yeah. Um, in our final minutes, I would love to hear um, just a quick kind of lightning round. Um, if you had to leave people with one takeaway, what would you want to make sure that they understand about this conversation and this this topic? Um, Liz, do you want to start us off? Sure. I think everybody mentioned this, and uh, we've probably all said it a few times, but it's all about flexibility. This is not the only, unfortunately, not the only pandemic we're all going to experience and uh, we can certainly experience a lot worse ones. So having the ability to change quickly uh, and to protect your staff and to protect your patients is critical. That's great, thank you. Althea? I think having the ability to elect one leader, Mm -hmm. one main leader, so that the communication would be channeled appropriately. I have a great love and a great respect now for our new mute all. That's how we controlled some people, just by muting them. Because it was utter confusion in the beginning. And we just need to know the correct information, 
the current information and that's relevant to what we're dealing with. So having a great team that constitutes one leader that we can be guided accordingly. So that's is there, I'm like, hands down, yes. Um, yes. Is there anything related to the built environment that, that you feel like we need to make sure that we consider? Like, sort like of how we design or think about planning for the future? Oh, definitely. The flexibility, having provisional, um, <laughs> not necessarily having, right? Um, we, we really do need to involve the caregivers in the discussion of the design. You know, we are the ones at the front line. I had to get out from this cushy environment and be on the front line. And so we know what our patients' needs are. There's one more thing that I don't, you know, I know we're out of time, but the ability to involve the patient in the, um, the like the telehealth, rather than just having a television, we need to be able to turn that provisionally into, well, that we inherent, into a source of communication to the outside world, whether it's to the staff, or whether it's to the patient. So no longer you're pressing a bell and you're talking through to somebody outside. We want to be able to flip a switch and we could see our caregiver, our family members, especially with the visitation um, uh, constraints. Yeah, that was such a, such a big one. Uh, Bill? Sorry. Um, you know, I, I guess, um, I think it's about kind of rethinking flexibility. I think that anybody that's been in our industry for a while has known that, oh, we, we've always designed for flexibility, but guess what? It wasn't the right flexibility. And so I think we have to rethink it, right? A lot of um, activity around flexibility was about acuity adaptability, but we were really talking about, can you move a med surge room to an ICU? We weren't thinking that they all wanted to be infectious isolation rooms, right? So there, I think we have to rethink about that. We have to rethink about, you know, core spaces and how they need to be flexible, to, you know, to provide different uh, uh, caregiver uh, uh, um, flexibility strategies for donning and doffing and for PPE storage and all of these different things. I just think we have to kind of tear the Band-Aid off the old version of uh, flexibility and rethink it. Um, and, um, and again, I, I am sensitive, though, that we don't, um, you know, the healthcare industry, you know, uh, works on some tight margins. And, um, and so, you know, we have to come up with strategies that are not burdensome to their ability to be effective, uh, you know, and, and stay, you know, operational. So I, I think balancing these things is, is going to be key moving forward. Thanks. And Jason? Yeah, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of sad we didn't get a chance to talk a little bit about well-being, but I'm going to take it to a different place that we really didn't get a chance to talk about. But I think it's important we touched on it is that, you know, how through design can we enhance dignity? Right. And that's dignity for staff, for families and patients. You know, um, the pandemic has really made it hard for our those patients to connect with families. Uh, to your point, you know, the restrictions on visitation, they're they're required and they're necessary. But it makes it very hard for patients to have kind of a, a dignified experience uh, in the hospital. And in addition to that, you've got your caregivers who are, are working extra hours. Um, they're a high stress. They're oftentimes replacing family members in those, you know, tough moments. And so uh, where can we provide spaces for dignity for caregivers as well? And I think, um, you know, we just need to be thinking about those things, you know, as part of the overall ecosystem of how we're going to, you know, tackle this issue moving forward. Oh, that's such a good one. Um, I would love to open up that topic more for our um, next webinar. I, can I just say one thing yeah. just for Jason? Uh, you know, I quickly, I, I'm looking for an apartment for my daughter. And a lot of the apartments in Brooklyn now, they're creating those green space on the rooftop and at windowsills. So you're not just looking out at buildings. These are things that we could also think about for the patients. It's part of the healing atmosphere and for creating a therapeutic milieu by seeing living things and, and, and space. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. So I just wanted, I didn't want to go away without not adding that on to you. 
fabulous ad. Uh, thank you guys so much. I uh, appreciate everybody that has come and shared their insights and everyone that has come and attended. Um, we know that there's many places you could be and we appreciate you spending this time with us. Um, you'll receive a email with um, a link and a link to download the re full report. Um, and just thank you so much and God bless you all for keeping doing the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank, Thank you guys so much Thank for you. providing for us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. Nice meeting you, Liz. Hi, Althea. Oh, my.